Hello there, it's your boy Offie D, and I am playing Three Kingdoms Total War for this abridged campaign. That means we'll only be looking at the most interesting and relevant parts of the campaign with commentary and analysis throughout. And what is more relevant than picking your faction leader, which is how you start the game? This will of course determine what faction you'll be, and where specifically you'll start on the map. I wanted to play as a Yellow Turban leader because I'm always up for a revolution and the Yellow Turbans are basically overthrowing the elites of China right now. And specifically I'm going to pick Gong Du because he has an aggressive playstyle by the looks of things. He gets increased campaign movement range which I'm always up for, I think that suits my style. And for a more meta reason, he starts in the top left of the map whereas most characters actually start in the top right. So for a bit of variety in this campaign, we're going to be starting where most other campaigns don't start. Not that it particularly matters. You have to choose whether you want Romance or Records mode as the game begins. Romance mode being the more Warhammer style mode where your characters are superhuman and have these magical abilities. So you get a more character focused campaign. In this case, we're going to go with Records actually because I think romance should be saved for me doing a narrative campaign in this game, and I think records is just more my style overall. The first thing I did when the campaign started was open up the reforms tree. This is basically the technology tree, well it's not really a tree, a menu, where you pick various buffs you want to acquire, and you get one every four turns, that's how it's different to previous Total War games, so it's not dependent on your size or anything like that, you just get techs over time. And they do various things, but the one I'm picking in this case is to get even more campaign I movement cannot. range, because that's really what I want, so we're going to be as hyper-aggressive as possible in this campaign. The first thing we have to do is kill an enemy army that starts right next to our faction leader. So we'll save any kind of context about where we are or what we're going to be doing strategically for a bit later. Let's go right into a battle. We're fighting this small Han Empire force representing the Emperor himself and we've got a force of Yellow Turban Rebels. Our army is mostly cavalry actually, we've got loads of melee cav and horse archers and just a few foot units. So here's a little look at them in action. We are fighting a night battle as you can see, we start with the ability to do that unlocked on our faction leader which is particularly handy because night battles make things a lot easier for your side, the enemy get a huge morale debuff. We've got a few trash infantry like spears back there, but really we don't need to pay much attention to them in this battle because what the enemy have are lots of things that are vulnerable to being attacked by cavalry and we have loads of cavalry so I think the developers were just making it easy for us for this first battle even though it did say the starting situation was very hard. We are going to start things off with a very easy battle as I just plow into the enemy with our melee cav at first and then I'm going to rear attack them with the ranged cav and that's all we need to do. Both of our officers have melee cav as well by the way. Also by the way I should mention that I'm playing on hard difficulty for the campaign but normal difficulty for the battles and that means the enemy units don't have any buffs on them or anything, it's going to be up to the new and improved enemy AI to try and beat me fair and square, so basically this campaign will be finding out how well it can do that. In this case it doesn't really have a chance because all of its units are weak against mine and we just completely pile them from all directions. Their general was the last to go, he took a while to kill because he's a stalwart class officer, basically a tank class in RPG terms, and I presume the officer classes do have some effect on the abilities of their units in records mode, even though it's probably geared more towards the romance mode. Here we are then back on the campaign map, we lost pretty much nothing, and we stole some pocket change from the enemy, that's nice. We captured the enemy commander. I think sometimes you have the ability to recruit officers that you capture, but that's probably more for the normal factions because we're anti-establishment and we're fighting establishment officers, they'll never join our rebellion. So we don't have that option, but I do have the option to just let him walk away, and I'll do that because I'm always up for a velvet revolution. You also have the option for what to do with the captured soldiers, although strangely they don't appear to be mutually exclusive, so there I chose to take their supplies but I'm not sure if that implies we also ransomed them or recruited them into our army, which were the other options, but anyway. That's over, the Han Empire army is dead, and now it's time to make more of an assessment about what's actually going on. I completed a mission by winning that battle, and I've won this new weapon for Gong Du as a reward. 
I'm showing this only as an example of the fact that you can change your officer's equipment, and to point out that this is the sort of thing that will not be covered in this campaign in general. Several things I'll cover only in this first episode as an example, but broadly don't really matter to how the campaign progresses so we'll be skipping over them. Now then, let's take a little look around. We're quite near the capital in our starting position where the Emperor is being held captive. Not sure if capturing him is really useful to us as anti-imperial rebels, but who knows. But more importantly, we are surrounded by three of the Separatist warlords from the Han Empire and parts of the Han Empire itself, with which we are all at war. So there's Han Sui, Ma Tang and Zhang Lu to contend with and we're going to have to attack one of them very soon in order to carry out our aggressive expansionist policy, so now I need to decide which one it's going to be. Taking a look here at the top-down map, you can actually see more clearly there's a territory controlled by a faction just called Yellow Turban Rebellion, which isn't us, we're playing as the Yellow Turbans, but our faction is separate from them, our faction is just called Gong Du after our faction leader. We're not allied to the Yellow Turban Rebels, or the other potential Yellow Turban faction leaders that I could have picked. So we're just doing our own thing. As for what we're going to do for our initial strategy, I took a look and saw that Zhang Lu is both a trusting person and is, according to this screen, weaker than us. So I thought, let's just not worry about him and focus on going north. This is the diplomacy screen, by the way, that I'm looking at. But I can't do any diplomacy right now. You have to make a certain amount of progress in the game to unlock diplomatic options. Perhaps uh, just because we're rebels. I'm not sure how it is for the normal factions. But anyway, we can ignore diplomacy, which I probably was going to do anyway, in all fairness. Now, during the end turn sequence, we see that one of our rivals, Ma Tung, comes over and captures the territory that was controlled by that Yellow this Turban Rebellion faction. The territory, it says here, is called Wu Du, but it's actually just called town. It's a bit confusing how this works. You might have noted that my territory is also called Wudu. It's because the names on the settlements are the names of the province that it's in rather than the settlement itself. So this place is just town and it's in Wudu. It doesn't have a name unto itself. This confused me for a long time but I eventually got used to it. I'm not used to it at this point. I'm only not confused because I don't know what my own home region is actually called because I don't even check that sort of thing. Anyway, I had to decide whether I should attack them right away. I came over to besiege this town and took a look at their force. It's nothing too special and the balance bar is even. However, because we're attacking a town in this case, it's not all that suitable for our army to make this attack. I brought up the map here to take a look and you can see it's an urban area. And as I said, our army's mostly cavalry and that's not going to go very well, so I thought we'll just besiege them. They're only one turn away from being out of supplies, so a siege isn't a bad idea anyway. In the meantime, I decided to recruit a few more guys back in our territory and sort out the graphic settings, so now it's less dark. You might have spotted that it can be night on the campaign map and it's really hard to see what's going on, so hopefully you can now see a bit better. When I come to recruit armies, I noticed that this new guy, this new officer, recruits different units to what Gong Du can recruit. I'm still actually not sure how this even works, but it depends on who your officer is, what things they can recruit, rather than depending on buildings, like in the previous Total Wars. At least, that's my interpretation. I literally don't know, because I'm so aggressive, I'm not even going to try and find out. We'll just keep pressing on with the campaign. The enemy we're besieging with my tongue sally out, so we're going to have a battle against them. They have a few more men than us, but our troops are perhaps a little bit better. We don't have as many levied and low quality trash troops as them. It's a particularly lovely autumn evening as we set up for battle here. Some nice vibrant trees going on as I pick out my spot for the formation. There was a nice spot on the edge of the map that was behind some water. But this isn't like a river in previous Total War games, it's just shallow water, so it just means the enemy will slow down as they come to us. We're not going to choke point them with this or anything, but going to set up there anyway. I'm going to send most of our melee cav to go with our subordinate officer, Zheng Kai, I think he was called, to go wait in a forest nearby, so when the battle starts in and around that little stream, they'll appear to hopefully rear attack the enemy. Here come the enemy with their many glorious hot pink banners, but there is a bit of a problem as the enemy approach. They aren't actually going towards where I've set up because I've got these horse archers out here in a different position. Many of the infantry near Gong Du are actually hidden, 
So the AI thinks that most of my army is where these horse archers are and they're all coming over here and that's going to be a problem because this whole rear attack ambush style plan won't work. However, here is the max level super exploit way to get out of this situation for your reference. You just split your men up like this. You have to remember the AI can't see your units, it's trying to detect where you're positioned algorithmically, so you just have to have the strongest thing that the enemy can see be where you want them to go and they'll go towards that. So right now they can see four groups of my units but only one of them is stand out above the other ones so this guy must be the median position of my army and the algorithms decide that this is where the AI should send its forces. So now they will be walking towards my ambush very nice and they'll be ignoring my horse archers waiting on their flank and in fact I'm able to rain arrows on some of their men. Eventually they do get the idea that this isn't going to work and they start sending those troops to fight my horse archers but they're coming on their own this time the rest of the army won't support so now we can have some fun doing some skirmishing trying to keep our horse archers out of melee to gradually take out the enemy's medium cav they do have some armor so i guess they're somewhat resistant to arrow fire it wasn't doing all that much damage shooting at them even at close range but gradually we're taking them down they are catching up our horse archers aren't particularly fast However, the enemy also weren't really doing damage when they caught up. We were just somehow getting away with this. I kept running away, had to try with uh, skirmish mode on and off because you know the drill of the war sometimes. Using skirmish mode actually makes your guys run away very ineffectively. The issue we eventually had was that Pang De with a bunch of heavy cav shows up to get involved in this chase as well. And while my guys are probably faster on paper, they're also tired, so we're struggling to escape. My plan was to run to the other end of the map to draw Pang De away from the main fight so that as things got started he would be too far away to help. The issue is he's already catching up to my men. I say issue. Actually things were okay because even though the game does appear to have the ability for units to attack while moving like in Warhammer, you occasionally see it happening here, they don't do it very aggressively so even with the enemy in among my men we're just somehow getting away with this and we are going to be able to draw Pang De right up to the opposite corner of the map and then just engage him in melee once he's also tired and both sides are really too tired to damage each other at all. So that's actually going to be fine. Let's check in then with the enemy's main advance. All of the rest of their units have come over towards our little river stream thing and are setting up on the other side. They have loads of archers so in principle I'm screwed here. They could just kill me from the other side. But all of my guys are somehow hidden right here, so the enemy don't know these infantry are waiting. I'm not sure though what the AI is doing, it stopped and just reformed and then waited on that side of the river. And I thought that was quite amazing because if this was an earlier Total War AI, I would have expected them to plow in without reforming first, so definitely something's improved. They're potentially waiting for their other units to catch up before they commit. However, after a while, they started walking into the river and I immediately just charged out because if the enemy actually saw my men we'd be in trouble, they'd start shooting me as I said and by charging forwards we can start the melee while their archers are mostly towards the front of their formation so a lot of them weren't able to shoot because they were technically in melee. As for the fighting between the infantry on both sides, it's kind of an even thing, our yellow turban spearmen are a medium unit and the enemy's G units are medium, they've got some axemen in there who are also a medium unit. I haven't looked at the numbers or the stats or anything like that because that's how I roll, but we're fine for the most part. So now it's time to spring our trap, Gongdu's going around from the enemy's left and Jiang Kai comes in from their right with the rest of the melee cav. In this case I charged through my own men so I'm sure that wasn't that effective, but overall we are going to be surrounding the enemy, the archers start to rout. And while the G troops in there have a bonus against cavalry, I'm still just going to plow in and try to surround and pound everything, ignoring the fact our cavalry could be in danger. There's an enemy officer stuck in there as well who would be nice to take out. The only issue we're going to have here is something that I really noticed while filming the replay. While I was playing the battle, I thought it's strange how ineffective this encirclement was. I thought we'd kill all these guys because a lot of these units are routing and are totally surrounded. But here in the replay you can see why not much is happening. Our men just aren't attacking them and I'm not quite sure why. My cynical guess would be that to 
make the battles slower without having to rebalance the game. They just decrease the attack rate of everything, so even against routing units we're not really inflicting kills. So my encirclement strategy is less glorious than I thought it was going to be. But that said, we have still effectively won this battle. We're going to be taking out most of the enemy army, just very slowly. As for the situation with Pang De, while we've killed some of his bodyguards and he's killed some of our horse archers in a melee, we're now going to cancel this whole thing because we're quite near the edge of the map and I realise we can just pull all of our horse archers out of the battle entirely to prevent them taking more casualties. And Pang De is now so far away from everything, he's just going to have no impact, so our men have achieved their objective. Ma Tung also arrived to the battle, he was really late for some reason, moving really far behind the enemy's main force. But he's arriving to a situation where things are already dire for his men, and indeed as he arrives, the last non-routed unit goes and everything is over. I was taking another look here to inspect whether our men were really attacking the enemy, and they are trying sometimes, there's a kill. But sometimes the attacks don't kill enemies, so perhaps the game still has a hit point system for the units where they have to take a certain number of blows before they actually get taken down, which I never really liked, so that's a shame to see that going on. Perhaps it's just armor saves or something, I don't know. As for the heavy cav with Ma Tung, they're not going to have a very good time because all of our infantry are spearmen, so we can easily take him out. After that, I wanted to make an artistic point. Look at how nice it is to look at all the bodies in the river with the nice autumn lighting and all the banners left over from the fight just stuck in the ground. I thought this is quite a nice contrasting scene with the aftermath of a fight juxtaposed with the beauty of the environment. So that's nice, not the sort of thing Total War is for, but it does do it very well, I must say. Anyway, Pang De eventually comes over to our side of the map to fight us, so our spears have to take him down. He annoyingly has this unbreakable trait, which means we have to kill his unit to the last man in order to get out of this battle. So very slowly we're going to have to grind him down, he even killed a few of our men in the process which was annoying. Eventually, in the Great Mosh, we take everything out, and that's the end of the battle. A close victory for our troops. We did lose over 25% of our men, I think, 250 out of our 800 or so. So a little bit bloody, but the enemy lost way more and we will soon be able to replenish and reverse those losses. I was noting here it said we've won a whole load of duels. Duels are a thing in romance mode where your officers can fight separately to the rest of the battle, and I guess it interprets the units of officers fighting as duels as well. So maybe that was improving our morale or making things go better, I don't know, but it looks like we've won a whole load of duels. As for the after battle option, I'll be picking Recruit so we can get some of our losses recovered. Gongdu does a nice dance to celebrate, and now we just have to wait until the start of the next turn to auto resolve the rest of the enemy to death. That was a siege sally, so now we make our siege attack against a basically dead force. That's going to be the end of their remnants. I think Pang De and Ma Tung are going to be killed as well, and we have the option to. Occupy, loot and occupy, or sack the settlement, we will be occupying things because we're just looking to gain territory in as efficient a manner as possible. And that completes a mission, so we get a whole load of money for capturing something. Now that I have a territory, I decided to finally actually click on one of my territories and take a look at the building system, and this is where I started to get confused. I was like, why is there a picture of Ma Tung here in my little town? And the reason is because I'm selecting the entire province, or the commandery it's actually called. So these building slots are the slots across multiple regions. There are just many fewer slots than there were in previous games, which is why I was a bit confused. So we're going to repair up the town after destroying it in that auto resolve. And what we'll need to do is go to capture the silk trader controlled by what's left of Ma Tung's faction in order to say that we completely control Wu Du as a commandery. I recruited some more spears and a couple of archer units. Recruitment's not quite like in old Total War games. You recruit the shell of a unit and then it gradually replenishes up to full strength over time. So that means my army now could use more replenishment. I would get stronger if I did nothing, but I am going to go on the offensive anyway, just because I think we'll be fine to do so. I've got this mission here to improve my faction enlightenment level or something. This is akin to the Imperium system, and it's what I meant when I said I have to progress the game before I can do diplomacy. It roughly represents your progress in that it's influenced by how much territory you have, the levels of your characters, and how many techs you've researched. 
So as that goes up, you get various passive buffs, as explained here. That's the sort of thing I won't really be talking about in this campaign again, unless it happens to be particularly relevant to some decision that gets made. Anyway, all we need to do right now is keep walking towards this silk trader. And by the time we arrive, we're in luck because Martang doesn't have anything there. And the individual buildings just have like tiny garrisons, so maybe you couldn't capture them with, say, one unit. But actually, that said, since your one unit could just be a general on his own, you probably could capture them with one unit. But anyway, in this case, we just stomp in, auto resolve those guys, and there we go. Wu Du is now going to be ours. This will reduce my confusion when clicking on the partially controlled commandery and wondering why other bits can't be controlled by me. We now have all of it, so that's nice and easy. There were some Ma Tung forces nearby, actually, just hanging around, not close enough to reinforce or anything. And we will be seeing those guys again in a minute, actually, so we'll come back to them. Another thing to mention, just while I'm here, is that there is a public order system in the game. It's pretty much the same as in the previous games, and I probably won't talk about it unless it's really important at some point, since nothing happens if you do everything right with public order. Now, one other thing to mention along the same lines, actually, is that there's also a population system in the game, a much requested feature, but I must admit I have no idea how this actually works. I've got 30k people and it's neither going up or down, so I don't really know what that means or whether my recruitment reduces my population level and I need to watch out for it or anything, but we'll see. I'll see if the game ever forces me to care about it. Basically, that's how I tend to roll. Now, as for our strategic situation, with me advancing to the north, there is the risk that someone could attack me in the south, and that's why I was recruiting that new army earlier. And we'll probably come back to look at this uh, next time, because there is going to be some action down there. As for our main force, I'm just going to keep marching. We're going to go and try to finish off Ma Tung, because he does have one more territory here at Jingcheng. It's some horse pastures, and it's defended now by the army that we just saw recently. So we are going to have to go up against them. They're half dead though, by the looks of things, and the balance bar is certainly in our favour. While this was probably an auto-resolvable fight, I wanted to do it manually because I was looking at their army and I realised this is another case similar to that first battle we saw, where most of their army is weak against cavalry, so we can just overrun them and win with no casualties. And I was happy to see that this wasn't a siege battle or anything. When it says we're attacking horse pastures, it means that literally it's not a settlement that has horse pastures or anything, it's just some fields. Another nice artistic note, when you engage in a night battle, it actually has all these Chinese lanterns floating in the sky, which is quite a nice touch. Not that you should really be looking at that while playing. Another pointless thing to point out is that there actually are some horse pastures here, and some genuine horses trying to sleep will uh, hopefully not interrupt them too much by fighting over this little building. We are the aggressor in this battle, but I've set up in a defensive formation anyway just to start off. And at the back here, we've got these boys, the Yellow Turban Archers. I'll probably start going on about these guys throughout the rest of this series because these guys are really good and they're going to be providing a lot of service to the Yellow Turban Rebellion, let me tell you. My plan was to take all of my cavalry around the other side of the horse pastures to rear attack the enemy army while I attacked from the front, but long before I was ready to do that, the enemy just charged at me. That was fine, however, because they're now charging uphill towards our formation, and the OP Yellow Turban Archers will start doing their thing. The thing that's good about them is their attack has like double the missile damage of regular archers for some reason, and they shoot really fast, so while they run out of ammo very quickly as a result, they do so much damage and they're pretty accurate. So right here we're just routing the enemy infantry way before they get to our line by just gunning them down with those archers. The enemy tried to outflank me with some cav there, but our spears are well able to stop them. And then a little infantry melee will start on the hill as the two sides just charge into each other. Wasn't really expecting my men to do much in that melee because we're just locking them down so that we can go and attack them with everything else. The enemy's two officers were both strategist type officers, so they have weak bodyguards and they can't do very much in combat. They can. Do things like give units special formations and buffs, I think. I haven't got one myself, so I haven't tried it out. But in this case, their army is going to be so overwhelmed, I don't think any strategies will really help them. Their archers have completely separated from the rest of their army, and now we're just going to absolutely punish them for that. Our horse archers charge in from one side, our heavy cav are coming in from the other side, or medium cav, I think it is, with our general's bodyguards. And yes, those archers are toast. The rest of the fight's quickly being won with my own archers wiping out the enemy's strategist generals as they try to escape. 
I even just charged head on into some enemy spearmen with my medium cav, and this worked out because we are in a night battle, the debuff to enemy morale you get is much bigger than in the previous games. It takes off about half of their morale for a night battle, so you don't have to do very much to route units, making things nice and easy. That's a decisive victory then. We wiped the enemy out with basically no losses on our side, just what we needed. We'll steal a ton of cash and we will of course steal the territory as well. We're going to start capturing another commandery. This, by the way, was when I realized I was fighting two armies. Previously, I'd never noticed that the garrisons of towns had separate armies. I thought there weren't garrisons in the game at first. I really don't pay attention, but on the other hand, perhaps it could have been more obvious I was fighting two armies at once. I get the chance to recruit someone after this fight. I thought maybe it was telling me to level up that other guy, Jiang Kai, to make him a bigger officer or something, but I think this is just adding someone to your pool of candidates. It's like in Attila where you have this group of people from which you're allowed to recruit generals, and I was just adding someone else to that with that promotion. There's the Great Wall of China, we'll be walking past that as we continue marching on to fight our next enemy, which is Han Sui, who controls the rest of Jincheng Commandery. We're going to have to take him down to get total control of this area. So that's what we'll be doing in the next part, as well as fighting against Zhang Lu in the south. So I hope you'll join me for that, and perhaps even more of this Yellow Turban campaign.